I am joined here today by a man who needs no introduction, recent U.S. presidential candidate Brock Pierce, and we will be discussing the recent announcement of his presidential campaign. Hey, how's it going, Brock? Thanks for joining us here today. Really appreciate it. Well, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So congratulations on uh, your recent announcement for uh, president. Um, so I think all of us here are wondering, a little bit curious, why did you decide to announce your candidacy for president and why now? Well, um, I guess it's a story that's been with me my entire life. Uh, I guess uh, when I was 14 years old, I made a movie called um, First Kid. I played the second president of the United States of America and had my secret service agent. And let's just say this has been a calling in my life that I was choosing to ignore until more recently. But it really comes out of concern for the state of our nation and the state of the world right now. I feel we are very divided and we need a path to be reunited. I feel that the you know left is against the right and the right is against the left. It's very much a and us against them, there's contempt held by both sides. And what happened to the days when, you know, we used to be able to have conversations, conversations and convening in a way where we would have conversations with people with dignity and respect, even if we uh, disagreed with people, you know, at a minimum, we might learn something and at least learn something about that other person, their perspective, where they've come from, why they feel the way they do. And through that understanding, we can find compromise. We can find a path forward. And so I hope to deliver an important message to the American people that, you know, there is a path to harmonize uh, the left and the right. And I think it's critical right now. And also, I think from a technology perspective, it's also very relevant. If we want to move into the 21st century, if we want to create a future that we all want to live in, you know, it's going to be done with 21st century tools. And I think that we need people that understand what's actually happening in the world right now. And those of us in this business on the front lines are actually designing the tools, creating the systems that are going to create the future that we're all going to live in. And so uh, I'm super excited to, to deliver that message. And hopefully uh, this creates a spark that gives birth to a movement to bring about a wave of real change. Great. Yeah, no, I think those points really resonate with a lot of people. Um, so I think that, you know, the title of this fireside chat is Using Technology to Unite Us. Um, you know, this is obviously a blockchain conference, so we'd love to hear about that. But maybe if you could Go kind of give an overview of how you would use technology to start uniting the nation and, um, and you know, whatever else you would use it for. Well, uh, just to take an even slightly bigger step back, entrepreneurs built this nation. Entrepreneurs will be the ones that rebuild this nation or redefine whatever world we're, we're moving into. And technology clearly is at the forefront of, of making all of that happen. Uh, clearly, the stuff that we're doing in this space whether it be democratizing the global financial system in a way where everyone has equal access. I think that's a huge deal. You still have about a third of the planet that doesn't have access to basic financial services. We have nearly another third of the population of the planet with limited access, you know, lack of access to things like credit. And that's a problem that even exists here in the United States, as many of us don't realize, but all those check cashing stores, you know, all those payday loans, those are systems that are generally there for people that have been basically kept out of the, the financial system. And in this day and age, if you were going to redesign Maslow's hierarchy of needs, having a computer, which is a cell phone and an internet connection and basic financial services are essential to the pursuit of happiness. And so that's one aspect, for example, of what we can do. Obviously, this system brings transparency. Transparency, you know, sheds light to opaque markets. And I think transparency is uh, another thing that can have a very big impact on the world in which we live. Immutability instead of history or his story being consistently written by the victors, you know, fact or truth becomes written in such a way where no one has the power to edit what's happened, you know, which is also a big responsibility when you start to realize that your actions, the things that you do are going to be recorded in such a fashion that you're going to have to answer to it. And, um, you know, which is also another important thing in a world like that, which social media and other things have also enabled, you know, everything we do is public. And which also means we have to learn how to forgive and be understanding of the fact that this human experiment or this, this, this uh, human life is one that involves making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and getting back up again and, and trying to be better uh, each day as we, you know, continue to evolve. 
Um, so there's so many things that we can do. I mean, from a voter perspective, you know, we can have fair, honest elections in the future as this technology continues to proliferate. Um, owning your own data is another thing. I mean, we went from gold to oil. Data is the new oil. And most of us don't understand what's happening with our data, who has our data, how our data is being monetized. And I'm a big believer in the own your data movement. And we can double click on you know, any aspect of this you wish. Great. Yeah. So I think um, I'm kind of curious, you know, is there any tangible legislation that maybe in, say, the first 90 days that you would want to get to put push past? Um, I really like kind of you know, a lot of the points that you brought up about kind of owning your own da- data, um, you know, open access to finance. But um, are those kind of the things that you would highlight or maybe are there other things that would be kind of an initial priority in that first 90 days? Well, one of my biggest concerns right now is the United States historically has been the capital of innovation. And on the front lines of technologies like blockchain, I feel that this is not a great environment for innovators to build. I'm watching many of the best innovators in our nation moving to Asia, moving to Europe, moving to other places because they don't feel safe to innovate and experiment. You know, one of the things that the U.S. could do to retain the, that talent and retain those businesses is to create a sandbox that says, okay, you know, for your first two years of operations, and while your, your transaction volumes are below a certain level, that you are not restricted to, you know, call it the extremely expensive um, licenses and things that you need to be able to innovate. Creating a sandbox where the government isn't saying, okay, you know, this is forever okay, but let's at least create an environment where innovation is allowed to flourish. And uh, I feel like we're losing uh, on this front in a very big way. There's a, a new television show that came out on July 4th, the same day as we announced this, um, this campaign for running for president. Uh, it's called Open Source Money. It's on the Discovery Channel, and it highlights a bunch of these, uh, these points. And I'm concerned about the state of our nation and our future. You know, we're living through the fourth industrial revolution, and I think it's imperative that the U.S. is not only a participant in it, but the U.S. is at the forefront of it and the beneficiaries of these wonderful technologies that we're continuing to create that are driving financial inclusion and everything else that I just covered. Great. Yeah. So I think that you can really tell a lot by somebody, a lot about someone by who they surround themselves with. Um, So I'm kind of curious, like, are there any companies or individuals that, you know, if you, you know, if we have have president Brock Pierce uh, that you would pull up, that you would tap for cabinet positions or or other things. Um, Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a small business you know, person. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm consistently trying to make make great things out of nothing, and I've been blessed to, uh, to have done that a handful of times. And so, um, you know, I, I think that connecting with everyone, you know, corporatism, I don't think is the answer. I think that we need to be having conversations with everyone. Everyone has a voice, even if we've forgotten that, and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table. You know, for example. Um, I, I'm one of the only politicians I've seen that actually is honest about the fact that I don't have all the answers. Too often, politicians pretend to know everything, which is an impossibility. It's it's being honest about the fact that I don't have all the answers, and you try to bring the best possible people to the table to participate in that conversation so that we're informed as possible. And over the coming weeks, you will be seeing conversations between me and thought leaders in their respective fields, talking about policy and talking about the core pillars, principles, and values of this campaign to enable or to engage in a dialogue, a conversation that doesn't have an end. It's saying, okay, here's the best thinking based upon what we know today. And please, you know, participate, join us in this conversation. We all have something to add. The future is going to happen to us it's go- or it's going to happen with us. You know, exercise your civil duty, step up and exercise your civil responsibility, be part of the process. The future is what we make it. So please join us and be a part of that conversation, be a part of that process. You know, 50% of the population of the planet today is 35 years old or younger. And most of Generation Z, many millennials are not participating in this process. We've checked out. Let's not let decisions keep being made for us. Let's be part of this process and make sure that our voices are heard and that everyone is participating. I hope that, um, and I strongly believe that this election is going to have the highest turnout of first-time voters that we've ever seen in this country. Uh, I'm very focused on Generation Z. I'm very focused on the millennials because we have our fingers on the pulse. 
we actually understand how technology is changing the world around us and how it's affecting our lives. And we are best equipped, I think, to lead us into the future. Great. Yeah. So, I mean, as you, as you mentioned, you are involved in a lot of businesses. You are an entrepreneur time and time over again. But I think that many people would perhaps say that, um, you know, conflicts of interest or previous businesses that are then you know taken into a presidency might or, or politics in general might be the cause of a lot of the issues that we see today. Um, so if you were to be elected, would you put your crypto in a blind trust? Would you kind of you know no longer be involved in those businesses? Or how would you avoid some of those claims of conflict of interest if you're elected? Yeah, if elected, everything would end up in a blind trust. Um, and I think my track record of being blockchain agnostic speaks for itself. Uh, if you've ever watched me speak or talk, I'm, I'm never shilling a particular project. I'm consistently delivering the message to everyone in the industry that you know, my chain isn't better than your chain. My coin isn't better than your coin. If anyone succeeds in making the world a better place, we all win. And I think it's far too early in this process to be saying that this is the future. You know, let's encourage continual innovation across this sector. And, you know, we all have something to offer and we all have something to learn from. And let's make sure that we understand to work with each other, even though we might have different perspectives on the path forward. All of this innovation matters. And I think I've been probably the most vocal consistently in talking about chain agnosticism and that maximalism isn't the path forward. You know, let's let's respect everybody's innovation and let's respect everybody's different perspective on the right path forward. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to push any specific project. I'm here to, to push ideas and, and let those ideas, let those, you know, call them innovators you know, in free market sort of fashion, compete for adoption. And, and as, as things unfold, the, the, the best path forward will present itself based on the execution of those people that are building these systems and the adoption from the communities that are supporting it. And obviously the applications that get developed around it. In this la the last conversation, uh, before we jump on with that stable coins, I think that that's also a huge innovation. I mean, it's affecting how national currencies or how fiat money is being used. We all know that China is implementing these technologies. Other foreign governments are looking at it. And it doesn't seem like the United States is paying enough attention to this. Uh, and, and that, let call it bringing less friction to, to the movement of money is going to matter a great deal. You know, obviously at Bretton Woods 75 years ago, it was decided that the U.S. dollar would be the world reserve currency. And it's unclear how much longer the U.S. dollar will stay the world reserve currency. And if the U.S. dollar is not empowered by, call it the tools that exist today, to make the U.S. dollar the best dollar it can be, we are at risk of uh, uh, that that status changing even faster. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So I'm kind of curious, maybe if you have some opinions on you know China's DCEP initiative, like what you kind of think of that and how you would perhaps combat that. Do you think it's just simply developing the technology faster, um, having a more kind of open technological stack that other people can engage with, or how do you think the best route forward is, um, you know, with this perhaps new kind of monetary warfare uh, that might be coming uh, in the future? Yeah, I mean, that's how wars are fought today. They're asymmetric. They're currency, they're media, <laughs> um, they're, they're hacking, think cyber warfare, things of that nature. So we don't notice what's happening around us, but clearly we are living through very difficult times. And as China digitizes the renminbi and makes it available to places like Africa, and Latin America and Southeast Asia, you know, I can definitely envision a world where the renminbi or the RMB becomes a, a, a currency that is very much competing with the US dollar globally. And if the US dollar wishes to compete, it's going to have to have similar or it's going to have to have tools and features that make it comparable. It's going to have to have at least a, a comparable sort of feature set. And right now the dollar doesn't have that. And uh, clearly, nobody else has succeeded in that. Clearly, with projects like Tether, you know, the U.S. is still very well positioned to, to, to lead in this area. There's just not a lot of time to act. You know, we can't wait another four years. I mean, the time to act is now. And I think bringing this conversation to the forefront is what's important. I mean, Ron Paul ran for president three times but was never elected. But he shed a lot of light through those, through those conversations and through that process to things like the Federal Reserve. And so hopefully this running for president will bring a bunch of very important conversations to the forefront so that we're aware of it and so that we can engage in conversation about our respective future.
Yeah, I think um, like a lot of these kind of progressive positions or tech forward positions, a lot of the younger voters do support. Um, and as you mentioned previously, you really want to tap into that. You want to get them excited. You want them voting and participating. Do you think it's just by focusing on technology, focusing on subject matter that engages them? Or do you have another way to get people interested? I think there's kind of a real apathy in this country that people don't engage in the political process. Um, how do you plan to change that with your platform and how do you plan to engage with those younger voters? Well, I mean, you have to communicate with them through their preferred mediums. Um, you know, TikTok, for example, is where Generation Z is. And there's no politician <laughs> communicating through those platforms. You have to speak to people in their language and through their preferred mediums. And it's social at this point. I mean, this should end up being the first virtual campaign, which is especially relevant in a time like this with COVID and things just, you know, typical sort of uh, campaigning isn't really possible. You can't hold rallies in the way that you used to do. And so being able to deliver a message over the internet um, is more relevant now than it's ever been. And so um, you have to talk to people in their language and over their mediums. And that's going to be TikTok. That's going to be Instagram. That's going to be social. And it's going to be done through events in the same way that many of us have likely attended Zoom events. Uh, we've listened to music. We've connected with people. And I think that our generation is best suited uh, uh, to communicate through these mediums. I mean, it's inherent. It's what we do every day. We're not doing it because that's the, call it the, the mode of communication right now. It's what we do with or without COVID. This is already how we engage with each other. And, and look at, again, technology is allowing this to be possible. People tuning in from all over the world to be able to connect. And we can do this from the comfort of our own homes. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting you brought up, uh, you know, COVID. I think, you know, that's, like you said, it's the reason that we're here. It's the reason that we're talking over video chat, why this entire thing is virtual. Um, I'm kind of curious, like, how maybe a few ways that you would have handled this situation with uh, coronavirus differently. Um, I think that a lot of the problems I'd be interested to hear you touch on about using technology is that it's invasive, that it violates a lot of the privacies that the United States holds so highly and makes us uniquely, you know, America, uh, the United States. So um, how would you kind of straddle that line of, you know, using technology, but also making sure civil liberties and privacy are respected? Yeah, well, one example of where technology could have made a big impact on the lives of Americans is just with these you know, PPP checks, you know, your stimulus checks, your unemployment checks, things of that nature. A lot of people didn't receive their, their funds in a timely fashion. And with technology, that, those, that money, those funds could have been delivered to people much faster. And so this is an area where technology could have had a real impact on the families and the individuals that needed it most. You know, I'd say probably 70% of the American population right now is living in a state of discomfort or fear not knowing how they're going to pay their rent, pay their mortgage, put food on the table, and just generally uncertain about our collective future. And so this is an area where technology could be enhancing our lives. And I truly believe that technology is here. We should be embracing it, not fearing it. But we also need people that understand the risks associated with it. Technology is neither good or bad. It's how we use it that matters. And clearly, things like privacy matter a great deal. Owning your own data, I think, is an initiative in, in where this can have a real impact. Clearly, I'm a big believer in freedom. And one of the questions I would encourage everyone to think about, which is, what does freedom mean to you? You know, what is freedom to you? Because we really have an opportunity to redefine these things. And these things need to be redefined based upon the present reality of the world in which we live. The world has changed. And so we need to redefine these ideas, these concepts, to make sure that they still suit us and are serving our wishes. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's not just on the front of freedom. It's, I encourage everyone to, to look inward, certainly during this time of COVID, where you have time that historically you may not have had, which is, what are your values? What are your principles? You know, thinking about your moral compass, what's up, what's down, what's right, what's wrong to you? You know, and as you start to, to, to have answers to these questions, you, you start to know what you stand for. You start to build a solid foundation for who you are. And through that process, as you define yourself, we also have the potential, the possibility to redefine what we are and who we are collectively. We have an opportunity to redefine what it is to be an American. And these are the sorts of things that I think we should all be focused on, because I think too often we're, we're, we're lost. And when you don't know what you stand for, whoever the last person to speak to you or whatever media or news that you're watching has the potential to influence you. It has the potential to ma manipulate you. 
once you are solid in your foundation and know who you are and what matters to you, you're not easily manipulated. You know, make these decisions for yourself. You know, take the time to become informed enough to know who and what you stand for. I mean, pretty basic stuff, but I feel like, you know, our education system doesn't teach us the basics. Our education system is a system of indoctrination. It's not a system really giving us the tools. And my parents didn't teach me to the degree I wish they had. And I think that we're all in a similar position. And that's why we need to understand these, like, you know, just basic questions. And as you start to answer them for yourselves, we'll all be better off. Yeah, no, great. I think like we really touched on a wide swath of things there. I think we could have spent another 20 minutes kind of unpacking all that. But um, as we're kind of about at the end of our session, you know, where can people kind of learn more about this platform? Where can people engage with you? Um, you know, if you wanted to have maybe a few final words and then where people can uh, then follow up about your campaign, that'd be great. Yeah, you can go to brock.vote as a website. You can sign up if you're interested in being, a, um, if you want to be a supporter, if you want to be a volunteer. If you want to be a donor, you can also follow us on all social media, whether it be Twitter, it's at Brock Pierce, Instagram, you can find us on every social account. And we are going to be continually releasing content. We are a content machine. Also, if you're a meme maker, uh, we have a contest, I think, ending today for the best meme. I'm giving away 0.11 BTC to whoever gets the uh, uh, most popular meme with the most retweets. So uh, uh, that's on Twitter. Uh, but we're going to be continually engaging. And most importantly, I'm not here to talk to you. I'm here to have a conversation with you. If you have an opinion, join us and be part of this conversation. This is an invitation to participate. And as each piece of the platform is being revealed, it's not saying this is what it is. It's saying this is how it starts. I would expect that uh, our positions and policies are likely going to sit in things like GitHub so that we can crowdsource you know, these answers. So if you're interested in being part of a policy conversation and actually feeling like your voice will be heard, you know, sign up, join us and, uh, and be part of this conversation. The future will be what we make it. And I think the future is now. I think this is the 11th hour. I think this is our defining moment. And so let's stand up for what we believe in. Great. Well, like I said, uh, unfortunately, at the end of our session, but really appreciate your time, Brock. Uh, best of luck in the coming campaign. And uh, yeah, <laughs> appreciate you coming and looking forward to talking shortly. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it.